Hello everyone and welcome to this first resource video for the Physics 117 course. My name is Simon Bates and I'm a professor of teaching in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and one of the two instructors on this physics course. This is the first of a series of five or so resource videos that we've created to try and help you get the most out of the course, to try and help you succeed, really. We'll cover a variety of topics and we'll release them at various stages throughout the course. In this one, I want to focus on the details of how the course is organized and a little bit about why we've organized it the way that we have. We'll tell you specifically how the various components of the course fit together. We'll summarize the assessment components and how these fit together. And then we'll finish with a few things that you absolutely need to do before the course really gets up to full speed next week in week two. Just before we do that though, let me start by asking you a question. Think of something you're really good at doesn't have to be anything to do with academic study. could be something you've done as a hobby or an interest. Absolutely anything. Now think of one word that describes how you got to be good or really good at that thing you just thought about. Now, I'm guessing that some of you, maybe even most of you, thought of a word like practice or something like it and that idea <clears throat> really underpins some of the design principles that we've used in putting this course together. We believe firmly that I expressed it here as learning is a contact sport, right? In other words, you are going to need to roll your sleeves up to get stuck in and really engage and sometimes maybe struggle with the material contained within this course. And to do that, one of the key techniques we'll be using is what some of you might have thought of in response to that last question, and that is practice. The second sort of key idea or principle that we've used to build the course is that memorization is not the same as understanding. So information and being able to memorize that or use it is not really the same as deeply, deeply understanding it. And, you know, nowadays, all of us have access to virtually unlimited information about a whole variety of topics, introductory physics being just one of them. So our job is to help you navigate and make sense of that information so that it leads you to greater understanding. The third key idea is around collaborative learning. We see you and us as part of a learning community in this course. And although you could learn all of this material and quite possibly pass the course entirely on your own without speaking to another person, learning often works best as a sort of social interaction between people. So a lot of the activities, the assessments, and things that we've put into this course are based around the ideas of collaborative learning and supporting each other as you go through the course. And the final idea, it, it's sort of similar to the first one, uh, that learning is a contact sport, is the idea that we can be your guides, we can provide support and assistance, but you really need to put in the work. Okay, so we're there to support you and we will provide lots of support and assistance, but ultimately you are the one who will determine how well you succeed at this course. So let me let you into a little secret about how people, people's brains work. It said here, says here student brain activity. Actually, this holds for most people, even physics professors. Um, and the basic idea that I'm showing here, it actually comes from published research, and I'll show you the research reference in a moment. But what we're plotting here on this graph is electrodermal activity 
measured through wearing a bracelet. So that's the electrical signals through the skin, which these researchers say can be taken as a proxy for brain activity. So this isn't people wired up with electrodes on their heads, but it's wearing things that determine the electrical signals through their skin and using that as a proxy for brain activity over time. So time is the, uh, the, the horizontal axis over a significant period of time. So I've got another question for you. Which of the three, four categories here that I've labeled shows brain activity during a traditional lecture class. Take a moment to think about it. The answer might surprise you. It's actually D. And the thing that might have thrown you a little bit is that the time axis here starts in the late afternoon. And Actually, as I said, this is from, uh, from a published... Well, first of all, the first thing to say is there doesn't appear to be an awful lot going on in terms of brain activity inside this class. These were, as far as I can tell, very traditional classes where students basically sat there and listened to the, uh, to the professor talk and maybe tried to take notes, maybe tried to stay awake. It's part of a published study that actually looked at wearing these devices to as a proxy for brain activity over a seven day period. And the detail here might be too sort of blurry for you to read depending on what size screen you're looking at. But the key thing here is that the class periods, there's even less going on in the class time than there is in lab time. In fact, the thing that looks an awful lot like brain activity during class time is watching TV, which is a pretty passive activity. So the whole point of showing you this is that our classes are designed not to have your brain activity look like this. We don't want you to be passive. We want you to be engaged. We want you to be active. And the way we've put the classes together will, uh, will actually help with that. So let me talk a little bit about the various course components and how they fit together. Um, there's basically three main sets of course components and once the course gets up to speed each of these will be happening on a different topic during the same week. So let's take them one at a time. First of all, ahead of coming to class we will set you pre-reading from the textbook along with a reading quiz to give you some initial exposure, familiarity, understanding of the contact content that we're going to be studying in class next week. So that's in the first week before we get to class. The following week we'll have lectures and we'll use those as active ways to help you make sense of the material, to do some practice and to motivate your interest in the topics that we're studying. And then the third component is the week after we've covered it in lectures, we'll spend time in the tutorial sessions that you've signed up for uh, to focus on problem solving skills and we'll be doing some tests in there as well. So this sort of three week rhythm of pre-reading, studying in class, consolidating in tutorials gets interleaved with the content as we go along. So by the time we're into, say, week five, you'll be doing pre-reading for week six, you'll be working on the material for week five in class, and you'll be doing problem solving and maybe a test on the material that we had in week four. So that's how the, the sort of mechanics of the, uh, the course actually works. Don't worry too much if this is too small for you to read. Um, this is a map of how the course components fit into the assessment structure. And there's a PDF of this on the course website, so please don't think you've got to try and strain your eyes to read this or, or take notes. Just look for the PDF on the course site that's sort of rainbow colored and you'll be able to get a copy of this. But I just wanted to show it to highlight the way the activities translate into assessments. So at the top here, we've got weekly 
reading and reading quizzes. That's the pre-reading material that I just talked about. Uh, and that's assessed as 10% of the, the course grade. We've got weekly practice through clicker questions that we'll do during the lectures. Uh, and that again is as we work through the material in class. Um, we have tests in yellow. These are tests that we'll give you in the tutorials. They add up to be 15% of your final grade. Um, here's something that you might not have come across before. It's an activity around reflecting what you know or reflecting on what you know and then taking steps to fill in the gaps where you don't know things. So we call it a learning log. And the idea is that as you go through the course, you will make mistakes, you will get things wrong. We want you to be able to correct these mistakes to really master the material. Uh, and so we want you to do that by keeping this learning log. It needs to contain various things like tests, tutorial tests, reading quiz tests, midterms and things like that. Um, and because you might not have done one of these, we'll give you plenty more details and advice on what it is and how to build it as the course goes on. But that counts for 10% of the, uh, the final course grade. Um, so we're up to 40% on the continuous assessment work, in other words, the work that you do as the course goes on. We've then got the exams in red, we have midterms 10% and the final exam worth 50%. So it's just to show you on one page the overall assessment structure and how all the pieces fit together. And as I say, there's a PDF on the, uh, on the course site. Okay, on to how we're going to use lecture time. I've already covered some of this. It's an interactive class. You need to be awake, engaged, and active. In other words, be prepared to ask questions, to talk to your neighbors, to work together, during the lectures. These are hopefully not going to produce that flat line trace uh, that you saw on an earlier slide. Um, because the lectures are interactive and we have discussions and, and input from, from the students, you could be called on to participate. Now this is not done to try and single someone out and see if they're the smart one who's got all the right answers. Um, because really no answer is a bad answer. What we're trying to do is surface these misunderstandings and correct them. And, and, you know, chances are in a large class of 250 people, probably more this year, maybe 300 people, um, if you think the answer to a problem is, is because of reason X, even if you're wrong, there's a very, very good chance that a substantial fraction of the people in the room will think the same thing. Um, so we will, you know, sort of encourage participation and engagement. Not always from the same people either. Um, another thing I'd like to say about lectures is this idea of respecting others around you. And what I mean by that is, um, in terms of using digital devices, be aware that how you use them in a stepped lecture theatre environment impacts other people. So if you're using your laptop to look at the notes, to look at the the problems, to look something up online. Be aware that people to the side and behind you are going to be able to see your screen, they're going to hear what you're saying, they're going to be able, they could very well be distracted by it. So just general sort of ideas around respect for, uh, for your peers that are in the class. Uh, trivial stuff like let us know if you can't hear or you can't, you know, I've, I've forgotten to switch the display over from the projector to the document camera or something, just shout out, right? We don't want to uh, uh, wait until the end of the class for someone to say, I, actually, I couldn't read anything you were writing. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, our classes start at 11 o'clock, but we do know that some of you have relatively large distances to cover in relatively short periods of time, depending on where classes before and afterwards might be. So if you have to leave early or you have to come in late, do so in a way that, that sort of minimizes the disruption to other people. Um, okay, on the subject of making mistakes in the course, sometimes during the course this will happen, not literally, we hope, right? But metaphorically or figuratively, uh, you will come unseated from time to time. At least that's been the experience we've had teaching first-year students 
for uh, a number of years. And that's okay because mistakes and getting stuck on things and yet working that through is one of the most powerful ways to really learn something. You only have to watch young kids learn to do things, even learning to walk or ride a bike or anything. Mistakes and, and making corrections based on those mistakes are really, really important for, uh, for helping, you, helping you learn and master the material. So this kind of stuff happens and uh, it's okay. We'll be there to sort of dust you off and, and pick you up and help you figure out how to do it differently last, next time. Now, so far, uh, I realize I've not said much about what the course actually covers. And I'll get to that in just a second, but let me ask you another question before we, uh, we get there. Um, how long would you typically spend on a physics problem before you thought, oh, I can't do this and, and just give up? So pick one of those. There's no right answer here. So Now, you know, if you said, ooh, 50 plus minutes, because that's what I think you want me to say in response to this question. Well, there is no right answer. The only thing I would say is, if you chose A, or probably even B, and of course, it depends on the question, right? But a moderately hard question, like a, a you know, question you're practicing for an exam, something like that. If you chose here, then you might need to sort of recalibrate or readjust because we will set you problems in this course. And, and these really are problems, not exercises, right? So you've got to figure out how you're even going to tackle it before you can actually get started on it. And I'll say more about problem solving in another video. But we will set you problems that you're going to scratch your head trying to solve and think, how on earth do I do this? So, you know, some of them, not all of them, you may be more around the middle or even a little bit further to the bottom of this list. So these are not kind of plug and chug problems that you might have seen before. You might think you're very good at solving. Some of these will be much more substantive problems. Okay, onto what's actually in the course. And, you know, we're going to start covering that in lectures during the first week, so I won't say too much here, but basically in one sentence, the course is about why and how things move and how that changes as a function of time. And by things here, we're going to sit mostly in the realm of everyday object size things. We won't talk too much about molecules because, as some of you probably know, interesting and weird stuff starts to happen when you look at the motion of very small objects that are moving very, very fast. So we'll stay around the size of everyday objects, but you know we'll also get up to planetary-sized objects and do things about planets and orbits and things like that. So basically it's the stuff of how things move, why, and how that changes as a function of time. Okay, let me finish this first video with some instructions on what you really need to do next, ideally before the next class. Find the document on the course website called Things to Do at the Start of the Course. It's a single page document and it basically steps you through the things that you need to do as we bootstrap the course in the first week. Equally, if you're coming to the course slightly late, Definitely do that because that's what you need to do to start catching up. So read what's on it and do them. Uh, and there's one other resource video for this week. There's two of them in the first week. It's called How to Do Well in This Course. So find that and take a look at that. It's not as long as this one, uh, so it's probably about 10 minutes or so.